maybe this one. Okay. Yeah. So people, um, this week was a very important week in the sense of the course, also in, 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 in the sense of research, because yes, another gravitation wave has been detected. It literally is like clockwork now. Every week, pop, gravitation wave. There you go. So, lots of work, lots of interesting stuff happening, very good. But for you, it's also been an interesting week, I, I hope, I think, uh, as far as general relativity is concerned, because this is the week that we, for the first time, look at an actual, real space-time metric that nature actually employs, not one of those artificial ones that we make up to get you acquainted to doing uh, curvature calculations, namely the Schwarzschild um, <coughs> space-time. Um, before we get started on exercise and such. And uh, the exercises today are going to think, are going to, I think it will be very important. As in, there's lots of interesting stuff that you're going to pick up. It might even put some of the theory better in, in perspective. So it's, it's very important to go through these calculations. And we're going to see all these properties of black holes. I really wish we just had a full course on black holes. That would actually be, be pretty cool. Just simply, just, just a smart you fix. That would be, that would be great. But we're going to see a couple of cool stuff uh, uh, today. Um, any questions on the theory? Yes. Um, do you think it's important to know about the killing vectors? Ah, well, mm. that is one of those things that I um, uh, uh, that I that I skip. It's not that hard if you yeah, if I you so. if you skip some of the real underlying mathematics and just use it as a plug and play mechanism. It's not that difficult. But I did notice that the book uh, it takes that as its. Yeah. way of explaining how motion in, in, in uh, Schwarzschild space time is. Yeah. So um, I, I think most of you have seen this, yes, in the book, chapter 9.1, it mentions something that is called killing vectors and mentions this uh, as having already explained it in the previous chapter, yeah. chapter 8. Um, the answer is is is, uh, is no, I'm not going to ask it of you of, of during the exam. You don't really need it to solve. Uh, exercise in general, in general relativity, but it, it is a tool that makes life easier. So yeah. maybe That's we can spend a couple of minutes talking about it now. And let me tell you why the book does it. And that is because, here's my famous story again, the geodesic equations are ridiculously difficult. So what people do <coughs> when they find things very difficult is that they find, try to find mathematical tricks to make life easier. Uh, you know, a good example for the people who did electrodynamics is choosing the right gauge. Right, that really cleans up your mathematics. And uh, in classical mechanics, if you know that the energy of a system is conserved, then all of a sudden you don't always have to fully solve Newton's yeah. laws. Because you can use, well, but the energy does this, so therefore this must go up, and therefore that, that must go down. Now, such a trick also exists in general relativity, and yes, that is the theory of killing vectors. Now, killing was, is the name of a guy. It's not, uh, I think it was a German guy, so it doesn't mean that these vectors are killing or something like that, or they're very difficult. The idea of killing vectors, um, let me say it in words and try, try to see if, if it sounds familiar to you, okay? Now, a guy, his name was Killing, found out that if you have a curved space-time, that um, there are some places in the space-time, if you would move yourself from this place in the space-time to the other place in the space-time, the curvature around that particular, those two particular locations look exactly the same. You could have that. For instance, if you happen to live on a sphere, you can move to whatever place because everywhere in the sphere, you will, you, the curvature will look exactly the same. Now, there are some examples where things are not as easy. For instance, in the Schwarzschild space time, if you move a little bit close to the black hole, curvature will look different because it will be more curved. Yes? This is what the metric tells you. The metric tells you that things look different at different, loca uh, different radio locations. But what you can also have is that if you are at a black hole, let's take that as my example, that if you would move around a particular circle, you would move in theta or in phi direction, then along that direction, the curvature looks exactly the same. Right? This is from the circle of your Schwarzschild space time. Angles do not really matter for the amount of curvature. Then Killing found out if you find yourself with a space time or with a metric tensor that has a property that you can move from one place to the other place without underway changing the curvature, then there exists a number that does not change in time for that motion. So if you would be a person moving from one position in the space time to the other position in the space time, but you choose a path such that the curvature that you encounter along the way does not change, 
then along that motion there is a number that will not change. <coughs> is that related in any sense to Newton's theory? Yes. yes. And, and it's because the book doesn't mention yes. it. I mean, at least not in the chapters of the book. Does the book mention it or not? No. It, it doesn't, doesn't mention okay. Newton's theory. Now, but I mean, I remember when I, when, I, when I started my little story that I said, uh, t tell me if it sounds familiar yeah, to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, of course, some sort of space time curvature version of Newton's theory, mm -hmm. yes? That if that, that there is a symmetry, if you would move from one curvature to the other in the space time, but the curvature does not change, that in Noether's theorem you would call a symmetry. And in Noether's theorem, just your, your basic Lagrangian physics, you will find that there are numbers along that path that do not change. Now, the same thing holds in general relativity. Now, if you have numbers that do not change, to be clear here, I'm not talking about invariance. Inv uh, just to make that distinction clear one more time, invariance means you go from one coordinate system to the other coordinate system, and then a number doesn't change. I'm not talking about that. You're still in the same coordinate system, but in that coordinate system you change position, you, you change time, you change your space-time path. That the number is constant. Constant means that the number does not change in time. So, Noether's theorem is sort of like the, 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 the space-time, uh, excuse me, uh, the killing vectors are sort of like the space-time version of, uh, of Noether's theorem. Now, again, you don't have to know this, but maybe it's good to, for you to have seen this so you know uh, to interpret this chapter 9.8 of the book, the idea is very simple. If you look at your space time, this is my best rendition of, the, of, 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 of I think it's a Xi, one of the Greek letters, and the, 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 the killing vectors <coughs> are written as these things, yes? So it's a killing vector with four of these entries. If you find that Killing vectors also four vectors? Um, the the, well, the uh, uh, let me say provisionally, yes. Okay. Because four vectors, that term really only applies in full digital search to Minkowski space times. Because yeah, 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 sure. <coughs> we're not in Minkowski space time anymore. But it is a thing that transforms in the right way. So in that sense, it's the general characteristic okay. version of a four vector. But th that's a detail that uh, I'm going to skip for now. If you find yourself in a, with a metric tensor, so therefore with a space-time, you find that that metric tensor does not change along a particular direction, you put a 1 in the entry of this vector. Yes? Suppose that in phi direction your space-time does not change. Now phi is uh, in Schwarzschild space-time is the fourth one, the other ones you put to 0. There you go. This is not notice over Killing's uh, theorem yet. The Killing theorem is as follows. If you now take <coughs> the contraction of a Killing vector times the forward velocity, that the number that comes out is constant. Seems like it also should be invariant, right? Because it's a contraction it, it, of That is also true, and it's also invariant because of the contraction, yes. So it's constant, then it is invariant. But we're going to stick to the same coordinate system uh, throughout the, our space-time calculations. But you're right, if you would go to another coordinate system, it would also be invariant. So it's constant and an invariant, yes. Now what this constant is depends, as per typical, on your boundary conditions. But what does that mean? It means that if you would move along this particular four-velocity path through your space-time, then all kinds of numbers along that path will change. But this particular combination numbers will not change. Yeah. Now let's take one immediate uh, example of this. It, it's, it's sort of a long answer to your question, but I think it is it, it's nice to have seen this yes. I started by saying that I am forced to skip a couple of parts. And this is a very good question to actually smuggle some extra stuff in. So um, can you name me a killing vector of the Schwarzschild space time? No, well, here's one. Yes, I actually already gave one example. You doesn't doesn't matter how you move in phi direction. All right, so let's do this contraction. What is the answer? Uh, R squared sin squared theta. Let's do some writing first. So this is just a new rising of this is. You know how to raise and lower operators, it just means squeeze a metric in between, that's what I did. I raised this one, uh, this is actually wrong, I'm stupid here to make up. 
there you go. Uh, this contraction with this over U is exactly where the road there is. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, Killing's theorem tells you this is constant. Now, let's see what that is in our particular case. Well, um, uh, this, this uh, mu here can only have the value 1, can only be the phi coordinate. But then, I hope I'm not going too fast for people who just woken up. But because the metric is symmetric, that's what you uh, uh, or uh, no, diagonal, I should say. Because it's diagonal, that means if mu can only have the value 1, then the mu here, because of the diagonality of the, of the Schwarzschild metric, can also have only have the value 1. So that means this can only have the value 1. So this double contraction really just boils down to exactly one term. Right? It's in principle what, 16 terms. But the diagonality in the fact that this one contains most of the zeros ultimately gives you one term. That will be uh, phi, phi, u, phi. That's the one. This is constant. You, you, we even know what g phi, phi is. You tell me. Let's see if you uh, have your Schwarzschild metrics down. You will get this on your formula sheet, of course, but it will be good to know a couple of things by heart, so you don't have to look them up all the time. What is g phi phi from Schwarzschild? R squared, sine squared. Yes, r squared, sine squared theta. U phi is just u phi, it just means d phi d tau. And this is constant. In this context, this constant is typically given the name small l. There's a reason for this, and maybe people can already sort of guess why it's called small l, not one of the other symbols. If not, that's fine. Killing theorem just tells you it's a constant, I'm calling it l. And that means, let's restrict, we don't have to, but we, let's restrict ourselves to a motion, a u phi, that moves around the, uh, the flat plane, the xy plane. It means sine theta is, is 1, because theta is pi over 2. And you will get is you will get this. Felix, this will be actually relate to, uh, to a question that you asked a couple of days ago. Now, let's interpret this physically. So this is just the result of Killing's theorem, of this particular example of Killing's theorem. We will write down another one in a second. What does this mean physically? Let's do some physics now. This is the mathematical statement. We've used Killing's theorem, Noether's theorem of space-times. What does this mean? Try to interpret this. Here's your space sign, here's your black hole. We restricted ourselves to pi over 2. There's a mass moving about here. Its, it's motion in phi direction, I'm writing in circles, it doesn't have to be circles, it could be any motion, but its motion in phi direction uh, is given by u phi. It doesn't have the, same have the same speed around the black hole and don't accelerate or decelerate. Is it the same speed though? Well, if d phi is constant. Yes. But, the, but why is d phi constant like that? Because d phi over d tau is constant. Uh, the, the, no, it, it's L of r squared. It's not constant. Who says r is constant? Who says he's, that he stays with the same r? Okay. But you're right. If it, if it, if it was a circular orbit, if that's the orbit that you're looking for, then it tells you, oh, then the, the velocity around the black hole must be constant too. You're right. Now, suppose r is not constant. Suppose that uh, it's an ellipse. But what does it say then? How fast you have to go in order to stay yes. in orbit. It means. Oh, well, that's kind of cool. Yeah. It's kind of cool. It relates to uh, to your. I mean, so, I thought it was you, but somebody asked a question about if you have non-circular orbits around black holes. And then I mentioned, well, solving the Judas equations plural is very difficult for that. But using Killings here, we can immediately tell what happens, right? What happens if you're an ellipse? What happens to R? Is that a constant? No. No. So when you are close to the black hole, so let's take this ellipse. I'm going to make it very elongated. So here. So elongated that the other side is somewhere here. -ish. Okay. What does it tell you if the particle is here? What happens to the speed? That goes up. If you're far away, it goes down again. Now remember, not that it was you. You asked about seconds, uh, Kepler's second law a couple of days ago, when we were deriving Kepler's third law. Yeah. Now now we see Kepler's second law. Kepler's second law, for people not to know, from just normal Newtonian mechanics, tells you that the closer you are to the mass around which you are orbiting, the faster gravity will let you go through your, through your angle, through your arc. 
So the same rule still holds in general relativity. So it's pretty cool, right? So we've now proven that both Kepler's second and third law apply in around black holes. So here's a nice example. Now there's one condition for this, all of this to hold, for Killing's theorem in general. You have to be talking about geodesics. A geodesic is a solution to the geodesic equation. And if you remember, the geodesic equation tells you that you are only looking at things that are moving due to gravity. You have left all other forces out. So this, all of this only holds if you let gravity do the moving. So when there's no other forces present. I mean, obviously, you can go faster through the angle than uh, Killing's uh, theorem or Kepler's second law tells you. You, 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 know, you just put a couple of rocket button boosters on, on your little mass and you just boost yourself a little bit faster. So you can easily break this rule if you introduce extra forces. But if it were up to gravity, then this is the rule you will follow. So, pretty cool, right? Note that we have not solved the Judas equations. We haven't even looked at them. We haven't even written them down. So this, this, this is why uh, Hartle's book starts already before doing black hole stuff. The first space killing theorem. It says, well, you don't always have to solve differential equations to understand how things work. You can also do it by these arguments, which is pretty cool. Well, now that, I've, now that I've explained it, now the exam last year had actually uh, an exercise that, that had you prove killing's theorem for a particular situation, not a general, not a general statement, but for a particular situation. Well, it still sounds so. like a very evil question. No, 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 it's actually, uh, it's a pretty, uh, it, was a, it was a cool question. <coughs> <laughs> How many people solved it in the end? Oh, I, I, I forget, but I mean, the people who, who did the course last year did very well. Then again, there were eight people, so it's hard to do statistics on that, or eight or nine or something. But people did very well last year. They also wrote that as well, it was a very difficult course, but they did well. <laughs> okay, let's do one more example. Is there one other killing vector that you might care to point out in your Schwarzschild space-time? Oh, so theta. Theta? <coughs> oh, no, no. Um, but there is there is a theta in your, in your Schwarzschild metric, right? <coughs> yes. So you're not allowed to use theta as a killing. Give me some direction in space and time that you can walk in Schwarzschild space time without changing anything of the curvature. Think of the line element, for instance. What number are you allowed to change without changing anything? I will help you. I will write down the metric for you. Uh, 1 minus 2m over r. 2m over r minus 1 minus r squared, r squared sine squared theta. The rest are all zeros. Please to point towards a uh, coordinate in which you are free to move without changing anything in the metric. I think time is a good example, right? Time doesn't even appear in all things, so you're free to change time or whatever. It will not change your space time metric. So, Let's write down its scaling vector. What is the time scaling vector? Okay. That was the most mumbling way of saying it, but you're <laughs> <I forgot laughs> completely right. <laughs> all right. Correct. All right. So let's apply Killing's theorem. So up to this point, we're still okay. From this point on, we have to think. Well, you get the same, but you have dt, d top. There we go. And you have the uh, first entry, first left. That is correct. Um, this side, this killing <coughs> vector here now has a 1 over here. That means the new must be 1. That means this new must be 1. And then the, the diagonality of the, uh, the metric tensor tells you that new must be 1 as well. So this new must be 1. So the 16 terms all collapse to gtt ut. And we just have to write down then what that is. So we've now applied killing serum, GTT. I've already written down the space time metric. Should not be one. Waiting for some 
going to dictate. <coughs> One minus two and one over Thank I sincerely so hope that people are either just shy or just waking up, that they don't have difficulty reading off this number from the space-time metric, okay? That's if that is the case in week four, then we are in trouble. Okay, and um, ut <coughs> is again a constant, and in this context, this context typically is called e, small e. And that tells you that ut, which is dt d tau, is given by this number, 1 minus 2m over r. And we have another constant. Uh, this will tell you something about time dilation, right? Because dt d tau is time dilation between one observer and the other. By the way, who, who, is, this, uh, who is this guy? Who measures dt? Yes, the bookkeeper guy, the guy who's at infinity, who, who himself is not moving. And this tau is whatever other, whatever other guy you're looking at. And then his R, where that guy is, here's your, here's your time dilation. Now we did the time dilation ourselves a couple of days ago via the GDS equations. Note that there was a lot more work. This goes a lot faster. Now then why not do it like, like, like this always? Well, this is context dependent. It's very much like Newtonian physics. If you want to calculate how this pen will fly through, this, uh, through space, the moment that I throw it, you can either say, you know what, I know what its energy is at the moment that I left my hand. I do the, well, the, 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 the potential energy goes up, so there the kinetic energy must go down, and blah, blah, and you can sort of trace how it will fall, or you solve Newton's second law. Both will give you the right answer. Which one you choose, it's all fine, because it's equivalent mathematical ways of doing it. Which one is more practical is sort of the, the situation dependent. Now, before we continue, um, any dropped a question before? Can you think why this would be called L and this would be called E? Maybe you can think of Newtonian mechanical expressions that are also typically called L and or E. Angular momentum. Angular momentum? Maybe. Well, th th that certainly is written with an L, yes. What is E? Energy, but no. Is it energy or is it energy or not energy? Okay. Might be because for Noether's theorem, the symmetry was in yeah. time. Yes, you do remember from Noether's theorem in normal yeah. Yeah. Lagrange mechanics that if, if you could change your Lagrangian in time without changing your Lagrangian, then you could show that there is this number that is, that is conserved, that, is, that, that then we call the energy. Well, we have done exactly this, yes. We've changed a little bit through, to, through time, or not even a little, a little bit, you can change as much through time as you want without changing the, the, the curvature. You get a constant, we call it energy, just by complete direct comparison. But there's many other ways of seeing the exact same thing. <coughs> because look, I think about special relativity for a moment. You might remember that dt, d tau over there was our usual gamma, special relativity, Minkowski space time. You might also remember that if you would multiply both sides by m, and let's put the c's in mc squared, then this is the energy, right? Mm -hmm. You must remember this from your special relativity course. So that means that dt d tau up, up until a factor of n is apparently the energy. This is why we call this small e, is energy divided by mass. So it's not the energy, it's energy per kilogram. Every amount of kilogram of this particle carries this amount of energy with it, or this amount of energy. In fact, let's do some interpretation. What happens if you go to uh, 2m? You get very close to the black hole at a radius of 2m. So it's here, at the event horizon of the, of the thing. What happens to your expression here? It goes to infinity. It goes to infinity, that's right. You get infinite time dilation. <laughs> that means the guy, the bookkeeper guy, all the way here, <coughs> looking inward, will say that it takes an infinite amount of time for this guy at the horizon to do anything. A guy looking inward at a black hole will see things have slowed down, literally to a standstill. That's what this expression tells you. So black holes slow down time. Not for the guy himself, by the way. For him, time just ticks on. But it's, it's the guy from infinity looking inward who says, wait a minute, your time has slowed down. You're not moving anymore. You're not doing anymore. So that's really cool. Yes, and here's the angular momentum thing. Because Newtonian, well, 
Ik heerst een Lagrangian physics argument. In Lagrangian physics, if you could write your Lagrangian, you could shift the angular direction by a fixed amount and would not change the Lagrangian, you ended up with something with a conserved quantity, that's noticed here, we call that angular momentum. That's what we did here, what well, we have the one here. You shift it through your space time without changing curvature, then therefore the constant that should come out should be your angular momentum. Well, we can make it more explicit, yes. The, the R, is it the distance measured by the bookkeeping guy? It is, right? Uh, 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 the distance measure of the guy traveling uh, from uh, the no, center to the... Yes, careful here. It's, it's where this mass is, but measured in the bookkeeping guy's yeah, yeah. Yes, that's, what I think that's correct, yes. It, this is not the R where the yeah. bookkeeper is. It's yeah, no, no, exactly. It's as measured by the bookkeeper. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this angular momentum, just by direct comparison with Noether's theorem from Lagrangian physics, is not a quick way. Do you remember from just your basic Newtonian physics what angular momentum is? Its expression, L capital L. It's an outer product of two vectors. V should be in your arsenal. Every every living and breathing physicist who's ever accidentally sat in a physics class. Velocity times mass. Sorry. Velocity times mass. Uh, no, that would be the linear momentum. Well, I'm angular sure. velocity times mass. Mm -hmm. the cross Philos of R. Yeah. Plus T yeah. cross. Yeah. Yeah. R and R and yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, the boss, uh, the, the oh, cross yeah. product of the. Uh, so it's a vector, yes. It points into a direction. It's a cross product of your um, uh, your radius and your and your uh, normal momentum. Well, let's just look at sizes, yes. I mean, this is a vector, but let's just look at the magnitude. Mm -hmm. The magnitude of a cross product, this is what you know from your either linear algebra, multivariable calculus, or your core mathematics, is RP times the sine between those two things. P, as you know, forget about relativity, classical mechanics would be M times V sine theta. Does it start to look familiar? Because if you remember, this originally had a sine theta. I crossed it out because we put sine theta to pi over 2, but it was there. But wait a minute, there's, there's a v, there's an r, there's a v, there's no v here, and here's an r squared. Am I messing something up? Probably not. No, the, the answer is, is indeed, but I do mess up regularly, but, but, but <laughs> not right now. Okay. Do you remember the relationship between angular momentum, so excuse me, angular velocity, and linear velocity, there's a relationship between the two. Yeah, there is an R. That's the relationship. <coughs> so, um, put that back in. You get R squared omega m sine theta is, in Newtonian physics, that will be your L. You know what? Let's divide everything by L. So it's angular momentum per unit mass. And then you get that L over R squared is indeed given by, oh, excuse me, this is wrong. This is, no, that is correct. L over R squared. L R squared goes to the other side, is given by omega, and omega, of course, is the angle per unit time. So it's nice, we have the conservation of angular momentum in Schwarzschild space time. That's pretty cool, right? So Killing theory is, is useful. So, sorry, it was a very long answer to your question, but uh, it, was, it was a very good opportunity for me to swallow some extra physics. So, I'm sorry for the tension, people, but uh, I hope you found this interesting and useful. This also means you can use this trick in other space science as well. If somebody gives you a space sign in or outside of this course, the first thing you might want to do is check whether there are some of these symmetries and immediately write down the constants of motion, what numbers are constant for, for things moving in that space time. Just like we did here. Again, this is what the book does. More. Any more questions? Because not. Then we're actually going to start with some uh, cool exercises. I don't really see why there's no symmetry around theta if you change theta because your center is a sphere. Mm -hmm. 
whether you change file, you go around it like this, <coughs> or whether you go around it like this. That's a good question. Should it seems to me like they should both be symmetrical. Uh, I'll give it to uh, to the audience here. Somebody knows the answer. I mean, I think you can tell. Uh, at least if you look from the outside, you can tell the difference, right? If you're at the equator mm -hmm. and you walk around, then you do a full circle. If you're not at the equator mm -hmm. and you walk around, you don't do a full circle. Um, they're really, like, at, at least if you look from the outside, you can tell that if you go up and down, it changes. Because at one point, you will even reach a pole. And a pole is where all the lines cross. You can tell that something is happening there. It's different from the equator in that sense, no? Mm -hmm. So it, it depends on how you define your coordinates because like in the in the thing itself you have just spherical symmetry. Yeah. So but then it depends on where you define your poles to be, I guess. Yeah, I think so. That is correct. Both of you are correct. So um, his original question was why is it that, that there's no killing vector for beta? <coughs> because you could tell by these by the space time metric that yeah there is a theta dependence, so you can, you're not free to change your thetas around. Mathematically, that's, that's a correct statement. But physically, what is a correct statement is that a, that a black hole looks the same in all directions, no matter how you put your theta and your phi. So why isn't the theta uh, symmetry represented in the space-time metric? That really is the heart of your question. And the answer is, is just uh, that if, if you're going to write down your space-time metric, you have to define thetas and phi. So you have to find some x, y, z coordinate system from which you define your theta and phi. That choice is arbitrary, but once that choice is made, your a theta will appear somewhere. So, it, so this representation of this theta is not because there's no spherical symmetry in your Schwarzschild space-time. It's just that we were forced to choose mm -hmm. an x, y, z coordinate from which to represent. <coughs> the so, any more questions? Everybody completely clear on what, how to calculate things in, in, in any space-time by this point? Have you seen how much you can do with the space-time metric? Somebody gives you this thing. <coughs> you can calculate how the space-time is curved. You can calculate how much distance is measured by any observer, how much time is measured by any observer. And secondly, Using the space time metric, you can calculate how things move if you leave it up to gravity due to the geodesic equations. So really, if you, somebody gives you this number, you are fixed for life in this space time. You can calculate everything that you want. You can calculate distances, durations, motion, everything. So this thing is your best friend. Okay. If no questions, then let's do an exercise. Now, what I wrote is that exercise 8, 9, and 10 from Hartel are actually very good to make. Um, and 8, 9, and 10 are really just three versions of really the same exercise. And I would like to go through uh, all of them just in one big go. Do you remember what the exercise was? I want to erase this. What was the first thing we got for today? Um, well, let me face it like this. You, you don't have to do anything. But I am going to discuss it. Okay. I think people in their second year are completely free to choose whether they want to, what they want to prioritize in their daily lives. make them before. So you're, you're, if you have any questions in on um, things that are unclear, they're much more crisp instead of just waiting to see how somebody does it and, and then later check if you understand. It's, it's good to run into problems. It makes the solutions much more um, retainable. You don't forget the, uh, the outcomes. It's, it's, it's now, please dictate. What is the question? Space ship is moving without power in a circle orbit of black, uh, about black hole of mass M. So there's a black hole, there's a spaceship. Does it say what, what the orbit is? It says it's 7M. The radius. 
of the orbit. Okay, but it's a fixed radius. Yeah, the radius of the orbit is seven m. Okay. And it asks, what is the period as measured by the observer, the bookkeeper, and what is the okay. period as measured by the spaceship? Okay, that's pretty cool. So there's a spaceship. It's in a circular orbit around the black hole. It says. And um, how many seconds does it take? It's a period, right? How many seconds does it take for the spaceship? A rendition of the spaceship. For the spaceship to go around, as seen by the spaceship himself. If you would ask the spaceship how long, how many seconds did it take you to go from here all the way back and then here again? How many seconds does that take as seen by you? And then there's the bookkeeper guy who's watching the spaceship move from infinity. While he himself is not moving with respect to the black hole. So this guy says, you guys, the, the, the spaceship has a period. It's called T infinity. By infinity, I mean as seen by the guy at infinity, the bookkeeper guy. And this guy says that there's a period. And let's call him TR. The period as seen if you are in radius of orbit R. So we have to calculate this number and we have to calculate that number, and what we are given is a couple of factoids, the mass of the, uh, the radius, this radius, is 7m. Now, 7m is close to a black hole. We already saw the killing stuff, is that 2m is where time comes to a standstill. That is really as close as you can get to a black hole and then be sucked in. Okay? Now, uh, 6m, for reasons that we're going to discuss a little bit later, is called the ISCO, innermost uh, stable circular orbit. It's as close as you can go to a black hole in a circular orbit without falling in. That's at 6m. If you try to have a circular orbit at, at a smaller rate than 6m, you will not succeed. <coughs> Gravity will not allow you. You will spiral in. So for light? Uh, no, for light it's, it's 3m. It's called a photosphere. So there's an ISCO at 6M and there's a photosphere at 3M. L light has a couple of special properties that makes it allowed to go a little bit closer to the black hole. So, but if 6M is as close you can get with a massive spaceship without falling in, then 7M is, is only 60% bigger. It's, it's almost as, big, as close as you can get. So it's pretty cool. So this is 7M. Suggestions? <coughs> well, what was the question again? How fast time goes to the spaceship and how fast time goes to the observer? How long does it take to, for the spaceship to start here, make full one full revolution, end up back here? As seen by the spaceship himself, that's TR, and as seen by the guy at infinity, that's T infinity. Both these numbers we need to know. I think okay. question A starts with asking what the uh, uh, is the infinity guy first? The infinity guy first. Okay. So, yeah. We already solved that last time. Yes, yes. uh, well, let's do it again. Okay. We did. Okay. Oh, let's do it again. So, the so what would be your starting point? The geodesic. I hear line element and I hear geodesic equation, so which one is it? I mean, you need both eventually. Why? You're right, but why? I'm, you can't. You first need to find the um, Pierce-Huffle symbols. Yeah, that makes you the geodesic equation, but your statement was after that. If you okay, well... Why do we need the geodesic equations to begin with? I don't think I understand the question. Okay, you made the statement well, that we're going to need the line element, and yes. we're going to need the geodesic equations. Yes. Okay, why do we need... Uh, can you tell, tell me for both of these ingredients why we're going to need them? It's good. It's, it's good to think a little bit why we're going, what we're going to need and why. So we're trying to find the geodesics for the circles. So that's why we need the geodesic equation to find the geodesic, and then okay. the line element because we have to compute. Them. Okay. I, I don't know. Maybe. No, it's compared. That's, that's, that's what I want to hear. Oh, okay. All right. I was. Uh, no, no, no. It's, 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 it's all good. Can we use the killing factors again? Well, we now we now now we know the killing factors. We can use them. Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So um, uh, we can do both, but I think we can. It's, it's more didactical if we go to the, the geodesic way for, yeah. for now. I mean, yes, what you could do by killing factors, in fact, much faster. Yeah, it seems like. But as, as, as a good educational tool, I think we should do the, the, the full geodesic. The killing never existed. 
Every joke I can think about it, I do. Okay, so killing never, never existed, nerds never existed. So we only have the geodesic equations to, uh, to, to, to deal with. But, but of course, he's right. Uh, if, if we're going to calculate this, then one thing that we're going to need is, is how the thing moves around, this, around the black hole. That's one. And then secondly, we're going to need uh, how we're going to calculate durations. So I could use some geodesic equations by now. Let's not write down the full geodesic equations for all motions. Let's immediately go to the ones for circular motion, because it is, the, the exercise says, you just have to look at circular motion. So, circular motion, what does that mean? It means that we have to take the Christoffel symbol with a phi at the top. Yes. But also the T, I think, yes. Yeah. Okay. Because the R Christoffel symbol, why not, why, why not the R Christoffel symbol? Oh yeah, because it doesn't. It's just a change. You have to make the idea. Yeah, careful here. It doesn't. Uh, it has no part in R. I I, I agree. Um, but its geodesic equation will tell us something. So let's let's not put circular motion into Christoffel. Uh, Languages. Let's just say what it says about the derivatives. This derivative is going to be zero in our view. Let's be questions. So the R D tau is going to be zero by definition of circular orbit. Anything else? The, uh, yeah, the, the, the angle of the theta. Yes, the theta angle. Good. Okay. Okay. Well, by the way, when they say an unpowered spaceship, they actually say that it's just uh, this flowery language is just uh, trying to be poetic or is there a reason that they, that they put no this? change in angular velocity uh, the, 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 the like we need it's, 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 it's because the geodesic only tells you what yeah. gravity does yeah. Yeah. yes mm -hmm. the unpowered part tells you that you're allowed to use the geodesic equations or the killing factors exactly. if, 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 if it says there is a power spaceship then the geodesic equations would only have told you how much gravity influences the motion you need an extra you would have you wouldn't need extra information, namely how much bucket boosters the thing had or how much magnetic field there was or something like that. The unpowered means something here. It means just gravity. So, which in mathematics just means just the geodesic equations, or if you want, you can use Gibbs theorem. Okay, so this is true. Let's write down the uh, the geodesic equations. There's four of them. And yes, we already wrote them down a couple of days ago, but it's good to do it again. The T D tau squared. I need somebody. I, I honestly don't know that by heart, so I, I really need you. Well, I don't know either. Sorry? I don't either. Okay, well, I'm sure somebody has either a book or notes yeah. or written on This one was you. The whole thing was you? Oh. Yeah, I'm oh, sure. So all Christophels was you? No, 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 the dt theta. D squared t theta squared. Ah, uh, yeah, in this sense, this equation was equal to zero. Yeah, that's what I I mean. see, okay. The Christoffel was zero. It, this is me being very truthful. I really don't know. I'm <laughs> suspecting that is true because I expect a constant uh, uh, time dilation. Yeah. But it will be good if you could check whether this is the case. I mean, it has to be, right? Sorry? I mean, it has to be. Well, yes, but the mathematics, so, but the math, we have to uh, check this by mathematics. It has to be because you expect. Yeah, but I mean, any other mathematic would tell us it isn't constant. What, what, what? If, if, well, if it wasn't zero, it couldn't be constant. Uh, I agree. So, yeah, okay. If it is zero, it also follows from the back. Yes. Yeah. Because either it's Christoffel symbols, the gamma with the tau on top are, are all zero. I don't think that they are. I think there's one non zero one. But it multiplies with a drd tau or something like yeah. that. And that one happens to be zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, of course, for physical reasons, I expect this to be zero, because that means dt d, t, d tau, the time dilation, is constant. Yeah, I was actually confused by this, because this is the same as gamma squared is zero, or am I seeing this wrong? You're seeing this wrong. Okay. Uh, dt d tau overall squared, that is gamma squared. Uh, and it, well, there will be gamma squared in Minkowski space time. Yeah. We're not in Minkowski space time. Gamma this gives you the special relativistic time dilation. There's also general uh, the curvature of time dilation. So you can sort of drop the whole gamma idea. That that's that, that, okay. that's okay with uh, for Minkowski space time. We're not there anymore. 
Okay. That's one view desk equation. Fine. Three more. I'm sure there's a view desk equation for D for, for R. Yeah, that's the only one. <laughs> the other ones are zero. All of them are zero. <coughs> yeah. Oh, really? Okay. So what is the, the, the geodesication in R? Well, uh, I wrote down the first term. I already know that this, this one is it's, it's going to be zero, right? If R is constant, then segregative is also going to be constant. Yeah. But there's some Christoffel business going on. That yeah. So what is the Christoffel business? Yeah. M over R times 1 minus 2 M over R. Yeah, d t d tau squared, and then minus r, one minus two m over r. And d the tau, I'm sure. Yeah. And all of this is zero. Yeah. Okay. And and this is zero. Uh, now there's also one for phi, there's also one for theta. Um, let's cut, uh, cut to the case, the other one's a zero, so zero as well. The other two remaining u decimals is zero, zero equals zero, which is correct. That's not an empty statement. If, if you would have found four is zero, then, you would have, then it would have told you that apparently you are not allowed to go in a certain orbit in the space time. If only one of the Geodesk equations tell you something that is mathematically untrue, then that motion is disqualified from existing. The fact that the other two give you zero, zero, and zero, zero. By the way, the d phi doesn't give you zero. You said g and c to one, right? Yes, g and c are ones, yes. By the way, this is zero, and then the theta is zero equals zero. These are the Geodesk equations in a circular orbit. I think. Um, the second one minus two m r is uh, the reciprocal. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm also thinking that that that's uh, this is reciprocal. This one, right? Could it be true? Can somebody check? I honestly don't know, but I sort of remember that I think that this should should not be one over. Yeah, I don't have one over no, my. No, it's, it was the same because they cancel out. If you move it on the other way, yeah. they, okay, they would so cancel. Okay, so I just I just miswrote when you when you spoke. Was it was it? one minus two m r. I'm sorry. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this was one. Okay. So and then it drops out. It doesn't yeah. drop out, by the way, always, really. I mean, I have the same number on both sides. It doesn't drop out. Are there, are there yeah. places where it does not drop out? Yeah. 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 Right, so here, yes, and over here, no. So which R, yeah, if exactly. R is changing. Yes. Well, also. Oh, but that doesn't matter. I mean, uh, yeah. as long as this is a number that's the same number, you're allowed to cross them out. Also in the limit cases, something. It's like if you have a two zeros on one equation, then you cancel out, you lose some meaning. That is, that is true. Yeah. Suppose that you would have been at R is 2M. Yeah. That famous strange orbit yeah. around the black hole. Then this would have been zero, that would have been zero. And crossing out both sides meant that you divided the whole thing yeah, by zero. Exactly. Which is mathematically not allowed. So again, you see something happens at 2M. This time, dt over d tau squared is gamma, or is it still not? It's still not gamma. And this is because we're not in the Minkowski equation. Yes, okay. because it, it, it's still the t tau is still time dilation, mm -hmm. but time dilation now consists of a special relativistic part, mm -hmm. which you would call gamma, plus a curvature part. Yeah. So yes, in special relativity, this would have been gamma in Minkowski space time. Not so anymore. Good. Okay. So what we find from this one is there is a constant time dilation. The t d tau is constant. <laughs> And this one says that d phi d tau is constant. By the way, both of these statements we saw before when we did tangent on killing vectors, right? Yeah. If r is constant, then both uh, the killing vectors would have told you that d phi and d tau would have been, or t and, and phi would have been, dt d tau, and d phi d tau would have been constant. What does this mean? Just checking, it will be a very good question on exam. Just explain that it is true and explain what it means physically. What does that mean? Dt tau is constant. 
time dilation never changes. Yeah. Uh, time does change. There is a difference between dt and, and dt. The time dilation is constant. The time dilation is constant. The amount of time that this guy measures and this guy measures compared to each other is, has a constant factor in between. So it's not that if you wait two years after orbiting, then all of a sudden they, they move out of pace or something like that. The amount of time dilation is a constant. In what case wouldn't it be constant? Um, well, time dilation is a good question. Time dilation is the combination of special relativistic time dilation, the fact that you have a velocity with respect to each other, mm. and time dilation due to curvature. But this guy is, is in a circular orbit, and circular orbit means that he will have the same curvature. So that number, should, its, gravita its curvature time dilation can only be a constant. He doesn't change his curvature as he goes. Okay. And this one tells you that the speed with which he goes is also constant. So both time dilations are exactly the same. Now, when would it not be constant? Well, if it was an ellipse. Okay. Because then its curvature along the path would change. But the speed would also change, so it doesn't cancel out? Uh, it, it, it will, no, it will not cancel out. Mm. In fact, that's what that killing factor told us, dt tau, uh, dt tau was one, one over, one minus two m over r mm. is constant. But if the r in that one changes, then you can clearly see that dt tau will not stay constant. But you can also not use the killing factor anymore in the case um, where you don't, where it's an ellipse. No, you can. Okay. Because phi is, r on phi is still a And also r on t. Yes. You yes, 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 yes. Oh, no, that is actually a good question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this question has, 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 a, has a deep, it's something that you could be misunderstanding at the heart of his, at the heart of his question. He asks, if you were in an ellipse, could you have used Killing theorem? Because, hey, Killing theorem says that your curvature along phi should be constant. Right? This is how you get your constant angular momentum. But he says, no, 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 that, that, that's not the case. Because in an ellipse, your, your, your phi is, 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 is not a constant. See the, the question here? So, is there, a, is there a symmetry in phi for an ellipse, for an elliptic orbit? Well, the orbit does not have a uh, does not have a uh, symmetry there, right? No, but the the, the space time does. The underlying space time yeah. does. Killing theorem is, is a statement about the symmetry of the space time, mm -hmm. not about the motion within that space time. So in that sense, it's different to Noether's theorem, right? No, it's that's that's still the same to Noether's theorem. Okay. Because in, in let let me take an example just again from classical mechanics, normal mechanics. Does Newton's law of gravity have a symmetry? Has a spherical symmetry? F gravity yes. is m m over r squared. It does have spherical symmetry. Yeah. Okay. Do all orbits that move due to Newtonian gravity have spherical symmetry? No. Not for changing r. If, if they change r within their orbit. Yes. But, 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 but uh, does Newtonian gravity predict orbits that are perfectly that the, the orbits are perfectly uh, symmetric, spherically symmetric? Mm -hmm. Right. It it, 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 it predicts ellipses. It predicts comets mm -hmm. that certainly do not have a spherical symmetry in their orbit. That's very much the same statement. The, you have to distinguish between a, a symmetry of the orbit and the symmetry of the underlying rule. Mm -hmm. The rule here has spherical symmetry even though the orbits don't. And very much the same in, in Schwarzschild space-time. An elliptic orbit does not have spherical symmetry. But notice theory does say no, but the space-time does. Mm -hmm. Now, before we go to break, um, this we understand. It's the total amount of, uh, of uh, time dilation, and because you move with constant velocity, the special relativistic time dilation is constant, and because in a circular orbit, the amount of curvature does not change along the orbit, the, the curvature time dilation does not change, so the total time dilation must be constant, so perfectly understandable. This one simply means, look, the thing moves with constant velocity through its, through its motion, all fine. Um, and this relation relates them to each other. So if you tell me 
dt d tau. Then this simulation tells me what the what what the, the resulting orbital velocity is. <laughs> I submit to you a following thing. Um, <laughs> Severi was walking by, so it, it, it's Severi related. Either she did whistling or she was being whistled at. <laughs> and I'm curious now which, was the, which of the two it is. <laughs> so, before we go to break, one final statement. Um, if you give me this number, I can, cal I can calculate this number via this intermittent relationship. Fine. But where do I get this number from to begin with? I have only one equation to fix two numbers. Now mathematics tells you if you have one equation to fix two numbers, you can relate them to each other, but you cannot uniquely fix them individually. But if, if that were the case, then at this black hole, any orbit, any circle orbit is sort of permissible. You yeah, can both set them equal to the same constant. With the separation of variables, I think we did something like this in quantum mechanics. Yeah, that's if you solve differential equations. We're not solving differential equations at this point. It's completely algebraic. This is just a number, this is just a number, and this just relates yeah, okay. numbers. There's no differential equation, there's no need for separation of variables. Do you see the issue here? We have one equation to fix two numbers. That's not enough. So we need another equation. One other thing that maybe relates these things to each other, because we're going to need two equations to fix these two numbers. Now we, we're not going to get them from the geodesic equations because those we've exhausted. Those are completely done by now. Can you think of an equation that we might want to put in? We have discussed the thing. Right. Line element? Hmm? The line element just tells you how much, what, how much space and how much time there is between two observers. We're now talking about motion. Yeah. Right? The line element just tells you how much space and how much time there is. It doesn't make statements about the, no, about the motion. Maybe the definition of the angle of velocity? No. That's already in there. It's just in. Angle of momentum? No. The same statement. Same thing, yeah. It's already in there. <coughs> we are missing an equation. What is that equation? I mentioned this during the very first tutorial that I said there's this one relation that I said put a big box around it because we're going to need it many times over. Of course, this has been a month. You might not have remembered. But there is an equation that you always have to put in. And we proved it during the, the first tutorial. Uh, no. Okay, there's one person who uh, no, no, no. makes the sound of knowledge. The sound of the first letter. Maybe go through your notes. Maybe think really hard. Could you repeat the first one? Yes. There is one equation missing from our system. So if one equation that relates this one to this one. Yeah. Which gives, tells me that if I know this number, I can calculate this number. But I still need some relation to tell me what the numbers are to be given. If I want to solve an x plus y is 10, the best I can do with this equation is tell you what y is if you give me an x. But I cannot tell you what x and y are separately. So I need another equation to relate x's and y's, and only then can I have any hopes of solving. That's correct. Okay, so Just two people. Line well, no, the, yes, that's a good well, suggestion. But the line element will only tell you about durations and distances, and where it doesn't tell you anything about motions. So uh, I think there's it, it's like, like uh, it's, it's slowly spreading out here what the answer is. No. Then um, I'm going to get a coffee, feel free to have a break, but after break I hope somebody has come up with the answer. And I hope that that's not this one person, not people just piggy banging on this guy's extensive memory. Maybe 
maybe we can relate the uh, um, with the E wait. and B, uh -huh. and then like uh, the DT Tau and the DT Tau with B and What is B? B momentum. Oh, from the small L maybe. Yeah, but now he's using killing serum. Killing serum is just another way of writing this, so we cannot use it. In order no, you're not. You're allowed to use it, but it will not put any extra information. In. Because it makes Getting sense serious, because just this information written in different yeah. mathematics. So yeah, putting that back in will not solve, give you any yeah. new stuff. We're looking for new stuff. Something we have not put in yet. Yeah. I'm going to get coffee. Is See you guys later. Is there one specific number important where the minus in it? Uh, the, the, the things in relativity tend to have minuses, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like a minus one in it? <laughs> there, might, there might be a minus one in it, yes. That you know how effect such and such is. Oh well, have people been thinking about what the uh, the missing ingredient is? I heard something about the minus one, which is uh, which is. Okay. Normalization. Normalization of the velocity. Normalization of four velocity people. Um, guys, 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 you. Uh, might remember that when we did uh, special relativity in week one, we proved that motion in a Minkowski spacetime should always have a norm normalized four velocity. Yes, that if you contract the four velocity with itself, it should give you minus one or minus c squared if you use the c units. We you also remember from uh, week two or three that we uh, week three was that that we uh, split up. Uh, motion in a curved space-time as if consisting of very small patches of local Lorentz frames where in each one of them you had special relativity. So that means it, it, each one of them uh, for plus you should be normalized. Right? Motion in a curved space-time means normalized for velocity. You have a curved space-time for which you move and it's made out of little patches of, of, of Minkowski space-time called local Lorentz frames that each and every one of them <coughs> will have you have your Normalized four velocity. So, again, special relativity tells you this. Or this is the Minkowski space time. If you're going to have a full amount of motion, because the metric brings all of the indices down. And you're going to integrate over all little patches of local Lorentz strings or local space times, local Minkowski space times you would still get the value minus 1. We've discussed extensively what happens if you're going to integrate small patches to big patches. You have to take into account that every next local Lorentz frame, every next Minkowski frame is a little bit different than the previous one. That's what the curvature does for you. And it effectively means that this becomes this. So this is the statement. Just as we saw that patching up your curve space time into little Minkowski space times, and in each of one, the path should be the shortest I, uh, proper time. So, therefore, over the whole motion through the curve space time, you should have the least proper time. You can solve the same argument that if each and every patch has a normalized forward velocity, the normalized velocity of the whole space time should be minus one. This is the ingredient that we're missing. And there's a very important lesson here. It tells you that if you have solved your geodesic equations, as we are in the process of doing here, and you have some solution, you haven't done all the work yet. You found as much information about the motion that the geodesic equations tell you, but then you still have to normalize your, uh, your, uh, your conclusions uh, by hand. This that you have to do yourself. The geodesic equations do not do this for you. So, strategy is solve the geodesics, get a solution, and then you by hand have to normalize it. That is the agreement that we're missing. In fact, let us write it down right now. The, what I, the statement that I just made is true for all geodesic motion in all space times. Not just this example, all curved space times, all geodesic motions. So let's do it right now. Let's put in our missing ingredient that we have to do by hand. Please tell me what the normalized the normalization of four velocity looks like in this particular situation where we have a uh, uh, Schwarzschild space time. 
and we have a circular orbit. What does this equation tell you? I need somebody to dictate this for me. You'll be able to say, you discuss amongst yourselves what ingredient you're going to need and who's going to write it down. Uh, I'll describe. Well, I mean, we need to write out this expression, so we need to select some mu's and mu's, and we know that they all should be the same, um, because g mu nu is diagonal. That's true. The double contraction due to the diagonality of a Schwarzschild space-time will just tell you every mu is accompanied by exactly the same mu, so that's correct. But it's, it's just a process of writing out. I agree. So if you would do that, you would get the full expression, but we are in but a specific case. Yeah, you also know that the RDT is going to be zero, mm -hmm. or the RD tau. The RD tau is going to be zero. And the theta d tau. Yes, so your suggestion would give you the full expression for any motion, Gilesky motion in Schwarzschild space. Yeah, they don't cancel out. There is yeah, zero. Yes, there is zero. Canceling means two of them add up to yeah. zero. They are zero apiece. Yes, our specific case now means, well, we have a certain orbit because the excess was friendly enough to give you a simple, simple case. That means that this contraction with an r here and a theta here, those are going to be zero. So the only thing you're going to have is g t t u t squared uh, plus g uh, phi phi u phi squared equals minus one. This was the missing ingredient. This relation related uh, dt d tau ut to d phi d tau u phi. Well, we already said, well, we have two of these things that we're looking for. We have only have one equation to connect them to each other. Nope, we have a second one. Here it is. GTT. We know this one. 1 minus 2m over r ut squared ut squared is dt d tau squared. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is uh, minus r squared and a sine theta, but mm -hmm. the theta is pi over 2. d phi d tau squared is minus 1. So again, important lesson when you solve the geodesic equations, you still have to put in by hand the normalization of forward velocity. So here you go. We now are in a situation that we can solve the, the system. If only we had done the killing vector of outside, right? we would have already been at the answer. But I told you this is more educational because I knew that you would not immediately know this. So I thought, you know what, let's. So we have this we have to find, this we have to find, we have this equation that relates them, we have this equation that relates them. This is an algebraic system, no differential equations, just numbers. And now you can solve it. Deep side. You're not looking forward to doing this on your exam. Is, 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 is it, was that the deep side? Yeah, just too many numbers. Would it help if I just pretend that we have solved this right here, right now, and I tell you what the resulting U5 is? That sounds this, amazing. That, that sounds good, yeah? Uh, yes, you will have to do this yourselves on the exam, but this is there's no physics here. This is just doing the, the math. Right, you, you take one stop suit in the other, solve for you for the d phi, d tau, blah, blah, blah. So I will give you the answers. You will find, if you solve this system, I hope that this one is nice and inky, you will find that d phi, d tau oh, <laughs> equals, <laughs> squared, equals m over r3, that's one. And the T D tau squared gives you oh, that's nice and beautiful. Gives you this this is the algebraic solution and you should have no difficulty finding these two from this set of steps. So, so, so we didn't have to integrate uh, in the I normalization. No, we did. Well, um, I get so frustrated. Let me take one step back. Exactly what do you mean by the guy? I'm not sure I understand the question. Because uh, uh, we said that uh, we divide the space time in small portion and then we integrate. Yeah, but inter yes. Yes. So it would, like, for the. Um, 
Minkowski metric tensor would be um, integration of eta and double contraction with uh, yes. u. Yes, but uh, here we have only g. Yes. Um, when I say integration of the part of the patches, it's, it's sort of a flowery way of saying it. So you're not actually do it for finding an antiderivative. Uh, it was just my way of saying take one patch, take the other patch, take the other patch. Which is the same as replacing all these patches by this, this one big metric tensor G mu nu. Okay, okay. So the integration thing that I said, they integrate over all patches, is, is just uh, uh, sort of poetic way, poetic way of saying we splice up our curves based them into small patches. Okay, good. Now, this apparently, now we have solved the system, really, we're now done. This tells you how things are uh, allowed to move if you leave them on the gravity in a search for orbit. It completely fixes how fast it moves and completely fixes how much time duration there is between the guy in the spaceship himself and the guy watching at infinity. Because the guy at infinity, as we discussed in the main lecture, measures this amount of time. The guy in the spaceship measures this amount of time and apparently this is their amount of mutual time dilation. So we have now really solved uh, exercise A and B. Almost. Right? Exercise A says, how long does it take as seen by infinity for this guy to move around once? And once we have that number, we can use this equation. So that's this number. Once we have that number, we can use this equation to find how many seconds it takes for the guy in the spaceship to do this. By the way, is it more or less seconds? The period as seen by the guy at infinity is that this takes more or, or uh, fewer seconds to do the revolution. It's based more. on the equation. More. The guy at infinity sees that the guy in the middle does more seconds. That is correct. Yeah, because you have one over us. Yes, yeah, so this, 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 this number is, uh, uh, is bigger than one. This again is the slowing down due to gravity. The guy at infinity, looking inward, mm -hmm. sees that the guy over there is moving much slower than the guy himself who is already thinks. So people who do astronomy and astrophysics, when they measure with a telescope, say an exoplanet moves around a black hole, you actually can do measurements like this. Yes, that you see how stars are moving around the black hole. You have this beautiful video that don't, uh, they don't have available right now. But you, they, they pinpoint at the center of the galaxy. You don't see the black hole there. You see black holes. <laughs> you see little stars that move about it. Uh, you, you might have seen it before. Um, if you, the people who do that calculation, they can just li literally by, by sight measure how long it takes for a star to orbit the black hole in the center of the galaxy. But they are aware that what they are measuring with their telescopes is this number. And if they don't want to know, well, how long does it take over there, they have to use an equation like this to convert it. And it's significantly different? Yeah, now look at this. In our example here, I mean, I haven't used the 7M mm -hmm. part. But if you put here 7m, you get 3m over, over, uh, over 7m. Mm -hmm. 1 minus 3 seventh, thevens, that's about uh, 1 half. Okay. It's about a factor of 2. So if you're in this orbit, the people in the spaceship uh, age twice uh, as, as slow as the people no. at infinity. Is so there any? Is it possible to survive in this orbit? Yeah, to absolutely. Do length, um, oh, yeah, yeah. The the spaghettification thing. Uh, yeah. I I don't I don't think so. I think the spaghettification is quite significant already. So that's sad. But if if you if you were if you if you were completely rigid mm -hmm. in your body structure, um, and you would orbit in a week on your own watch, and you would ask it, and you would go, you would ask the people out there how how long. Mm -hmm. uh, how much time has passed? And they would say two weeks. Mm -hmm. So do not spend too much time in that orbit. Because by the time that you spent uh, 30 years there, mm. um, everybody on Earth is, is six years further along. Yeah. So the effect becomes significant. It's interesting, right? But, but so the, the people who make observation assume that they are infinitely far away? Yes. Or do they actually uh, no, no, correct they assume, for that? They, they assume uh, it's infinitely far away. The closest black hole that we know of is this one in the, in the center of the galaxy, which is about 10,000 light years away, which means, well, that's. For all practical purposes, that is the same. In fact, the observer guy, we, have, we haven't done the calculation, but the observer guy, if you would have put that guy in, so the guy who observes, so here's the orbiting guy, here's the observer guy, if you would have done that, that exercise, you would have had this extra factor here. Uh, I put it to, I think it's a three, no, it's, 
well, it might be two or three, but you see that, that then the effect becomes quite different still. But if you are at 10,000 light years, then this is completely natural. So mm -hmm. he's, not, he's not at mathematical infinity, but at least for all practical purposes he is. Mm -hmm. So, we have st so we can see, we learn a lot of things about black holes, right? We see over and over again, the closer you get, the more spaghettified you get, and um, the slower your, your, what, the slower your time goes compared to the people outside of the black hole, further away from the black hole. So, so he said, if you get close to a black hole, not only do you get spaghettified, if you cross the two endpoint point, you are never going to get out, and even if you would, at the moment that you get out, the rest of the universe has already passed and died. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, do not go get close to black holes. Is the big so message. Here. Your time dilation is path dependent in this case, but your uh, the spaghettification will never be path dependent, right? Because if you go back to your original place at infinity, if you go to a black hole, you go back. Yes. You'll not be spaghettified. Oh, you will. You will remain like that. Oh no. Okay. You 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 stretch that. That's, that's true. Yes. But this is probably after you've already died, so these are going to be stretched back and then and then sent back to Earth. So at, at least you don't have to buy a bigger coffin for you. Okay, you will still still fit in the original one. Okay. So uh, now this is quite a nice sensible way of doing this exercise, but it is useful. You see all these beautiful effects. Now let's go to the actual exercise. The question was, how long does this take? The orbiting. Can we uh, get this from these equations? We need to know how many seconds this is. Well, we have the mass, we have the radius. Yes, we have the mass. So we can the calculate the angular momentum. Yes. Or uh, velocity. Yes, 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 yes. Let's take this one. Do we even need the angular velocity? Could we just say the change in phi has to be, well, in one circle, so two pi? Yeah, that's the same. Yeah, yeah, but I, th I think you're saying the same. Oh, okay, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. So then you'd integrate it, right? Yeah, you would, but in this case, because we're in a certain orbit, so yes, the, 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 the proper strategy would be to, you know what, take the square root of both sides. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you take a square root, you get plus or minus. Does that agree with your physical insight? No. Yeah. yeah. It just means uh, physics allows you to rotate in, in both directions, yes. So it's nice that physics agrees with our mathematics. Now let's say we fix the plus or the minus. Here the same by the way, plus minus. Hmm. Plus minus sign relation. That's strange. No preferred than that preferred. The mathematics says <laughs> you have a plus sign relation and minus sign relation. Yeah. Hmm. Let's take the plus one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. now, otherwise you would have that, that not only does the time flow with a different velocity. After you spent one week in your orbit, we already saw it's about a factor of two, mm. then the other people have gone two weeks into the past. Yeah. Mm. Which, yeah, according to mathematics, is allowed, but this is one of those cases that you say, you know what, maybe mathematics says a little bit too much. <laughs> let's, just, <laughs> let's throw away that option. Okay, so, yeah, let's go with Tom's suggestion. Um, let's take this equation. If you really want to be pedantic about this, you would have to write the tau on this side and then integrate both sides. In this case, you don't really have to because it's a constant, right? So instead of integrating, you might as well replace this immediately by the total amount. Would that be the case if it was not a surface orbit? If this also would, if something here would, would, would it be bent on tau, that trick would not have worked. But again, simple case. So let's do this. The d5, one full revolution. That's 2 pi, right? Mm -hmm. So we find that 2 pi over this, well, the amount of time that it takes, as seen by the spaceship people, we call that T capital R, is given by this big square root here. I'm still not using the 7m, so everything that I'm writing down now is at this point completely general for every circular orbit still. And, uh, well, you get an expression for TR from this. TR equals uh, 2 pi square root m over r3 one minus 3m over r. There you go. This exercise, well, A or B, one of them was calculated by the spaceship people. That's this number. That was pretty cool. Good. Okay. Now, 
the other exercise was now calculate the esteem by the, the, by, by the guy at infinity. Suggestions? Yeah. It should be easy by this point. Because you don't want to integrate the villain. Yeah, I mean, this is the time duration between these two people, right? So if you know how many seconds it takes for the guy in the spaceship, you can use this one to tell, to forget how long it takes for the guy in infinity. We're making explicit use of the fact that we proved on Tuesday that dt in the Schwarzschild metric is the time as measured by the guy in infinity. The bookkeeper guy. So, we find that dt, so this dt integrated over the full orbit, that's what we call t infinity in my notation here, uh, is just this expression times the detail of a spaceship person. So we're just using the time dilation now. I see beautiful things happening. Because this factor, I see that it should be something like this. 1 minus 3 m over r square root times d tau, and d tau was this one. And then you can see that so that, that, one, that one drops out. So I get 2 pi m over r3 square root. There you go. Did I make a mistake? Well, it's, that is multiplied by... Ah, no, it's 1 over. Yeah, yeah no, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, just a little bit sloppy notation here. Is in bad handwriting, m over r to the 3. There you go. There's that. It's not too hard, is it? I don't need that. I don't need Yep. So, that's pretty good. Let's do some interpretation. So there's no questions on, on how this was done. Um, I wrote down a fun extra conceptual question here. Uh, pom -pom -pom. Yeah, here it is. Guys, um, we had already seen that time comes to a standstill at the moment that you are at 2m. Agreed? That was, that was what we saw before. Time comes to a standstill at 2m. Yet, if you look at this expression, uh, or this one, or the time relation over here, this one, it happens at 3m. So, so which one is it? We saw before that if you get close to a black hole, then the guy looking from, from outside inward, the infinity guy, looks inward, and uh, uh, finds that it takes an infinite amount of time for a person close to a black hole to do anything. That happened at 2m from the Schwarzschild metric itself. Yet, for this, particular, for this particular exercise, it happens at 3m. Maybe it's not, because it's not only the general relativistic effects, but also the special relativistic effect that adds to it? Yes. Uh, that's exactly what I wrote down here. In fact, let me read it out loud. <laughs> okay. So, uh, pom pom pom. There's infinite time dilation at 3m, this is what I wrote down. Not to be confused with the infinite time dilation at r is 2m. This is me paraphrasing Zeph, okay? Better accurately because I wrote this a couple of days ago. So, not to be confused with the infinite time dilation at, at 2m, when you're actually on the black hole. Um, that one, that the 2m one, is purely gravitational. Whereas, uh, just reading out loud here, the purely gravitational, whereas the one at 3m is a sum of gravitational and special relativistic time dilation. You get the 2m infinite time dilation if you're standing still at 2m. But this guy is, is both close to the black hole, which gives him a little bit of time dilation, and on top of that is moving. So he gets a sum of two time dilations. So that means to get to infinity, he, it doesn't all have to come from the curvature. Some of it is provided by its motion. So it means the, the curvature time relation can ease up a little bit. So the guy at 3m gets a little bit of his time dilation from being close to the black hole at 3m and a little bit of, uh, of special relativity. And that combines uh, to the same amount as if he had been standing still at 2m. 
So that was a completely correct answer. Pretty good. How are we on time? Ten, 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 what, fifteen. Twelve. Fifteen. <coughs> what if we take this tutorial? Ah, uh, no, we do the following. Yes. Um, uh, I put you in an orbit at seven m. So all of you revolving here. I'll be standing over here, and I'll be sending you information. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So that means I have two weeks of information to give you. Uh, excuse me. Uh, 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 that is correct, yes? All the information comes with a factor of two. So I can send twice the amount of information in your amount of time. So we're pretty good. So we can extend 12 minutes to uh, half an hour or so. No, and actually, let's put you on 3M. Because that will mean that you would get an impact and send infinite amounts of information and it wouldn't cost you zero time at that point. Mm -hmm. If only we had a black hole close by. Oh well. Um, okay, what I will do is the following. There's also an exercise, by the way, uh, exercise uh, 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 8 and, uh, excuse me, 9 and 10. Uh, 8 is now completely done. Exercise 9 asks for these two equations. So we've solved that. We've done it kind of in one go. The reason that the book asks it in a separate question is because the book wanted you to do this by uh, Killing's theorem, which never had to calculate these things. We did it the long way. That means we've done 8 and 9 in one go. So 9 is solved as well. There's an exercise 10 that I would like to discuss in the, the last minutes. There was also one other exercise where I had you calculate if you would fall in Rayleigh to a black hole, how would that look for you? Mm -hmm. I think I will do the following. I will, ex I will do that one in full detail with the other group and just combine the two recordings together. So both groups will have both explanations. I think the other one is also very important. So you have the, uh, the privilege of hearing the, uh, the, 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 the orbit thing and the other people will hear the radio info. And uh, this is my way of... of, of getting twice the amount of information towards you without needing a black hole, so that's good. So now we're recording stuff. Okay, so, one final exercise, exercise 10. Uh, I forget what it was exactly though. If you have it somewhere, that would be great. This. I vaguely start to remember, but if you have it somewhere, again, it would be great. It says to um, find the linear velocity of a particle. Oh, yes. In the orbit of radius r. Okay. All in right. the Schwarzschild geometry. That will be measured by a stationary observer stationed at one point on the orbit. Okay. All right. So we are going to slightly change the situation now in exercise 8 and 9. Mm -hmm. What we have done, we've calculated how much time dilation there is yeah, most, between most the orbiting orbit. guy and the guy at infinity, the bookkeeper guy, infinity. In exercise 10, they introduce another observer, a third observer. The third observer in blue is a guy who's also at the orbit of 7m, but noteworthy uh, difference, he himself is not orbiting. So there's one observer. There's this guy who's orbiting, and there's this uh, seven, I don't know what they say, they don't, 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 don't speak <coughs> the radius, do they? Radius R. Okay, just radius R, okay, fine. So there's one guy orbiting, exact same circuit orbit as an exercise eight, so we just copy-paste these equations. Um, and there's another guy, um, also at this orbit, but not orbiting, he's standing still. This, by the way, is not a geodesic guy. You cannot stand still close to a black hole, you'll be sucked in. You, you, you need to move, otherwise it will suck you in. That doesn't stop us from doing these exercises, it just means that, the guy isn't, that this guy's position is not a solution to the geodesic equation. But it's fine, this guy can still be there, suppose he has a rocket ship, he's being sucked in, but at the same time his rocket ship is blasting outward and it balances each other out. Good. So, three observers now. We have the guy, oh, let's give you these guys names. Let's call this TR guy, stationary TR guy. Let's call this guy the orbiting guy. And this is our bookkeeper guy. What the exercise now asks is, how fast 
does this guy see this guy fly past? As seen from him, when this fly whiz, when this guy whizzes past, he has a particular velocity. And they ask for a linear velocity, right? Not really, I think that was, yes. Okay, so they really just ask for the v. So what is how fast, literally how many meters per second does this guy see that guy fly past? That's the exercise. Almost everything we need is already on the board. Just really pointing you towards the only things that we can use now. <laughs> so we don't have to think that hard, but it's, it's, you have to think conceptually a little bit. Well, the guy at infinity doesn't feel special or general relativity. The guy moving feels both. And the guy standing still there only feels general yeah, relativity. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Um, so the time dilation for one of them is over 3m, and for the other one is over 2m. Mm -hmm. And then we know that if I dt for the guy who's standing uh, at the zero. No, be careful. Phi doesn't change, right? Uh, yes. Oh, yes, yeah. oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, 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 you're right. This guy's phi does not change. Yes. Sorry, I. So then we have both equations for both people, and then we can just solve them mathematically. Okay. Uh, okay. Sounds like a plan. I think I missed a step, though. I mean, I heard the words, but I think there's a step missing. Well, let's first write down what a uh, orbital velocity <coughs> v, a linear velocity of something that goes into an orbit. Just generally, just from, it, from your Newtonian physics, no relativity involved at this point, how do you calculate V if you know it's omega, it's orbital, it's, it's angular velocity? Omega R. This is omega times R. Good. So this is just your basic um, Newtonian physics. All right. Uh, there's a couple of these Vs now. One of them is measured by this guy, one of them is measured by that guy, one of them is measured by that guy, the infinity guy. Here's the good news. We already know this omega as measured by the uh, orbiting guy. That's this expression, right? Mm -hmm. It's how, how much angle the orbiting guy measured in his own uh, time. So we can already immediately write down that V, uh, I call it orbital, is, uh, as seen by this guy, is how fast this guy feels he is going through his angles. That's this expression. And R, 1 minus 3M over R, times R. Okay, so we have that. So, okay. Hold on. Oh, I can't think now. Just go ahead and multiply the velocity times the time dilation of the guy who's standing. Uh, the, 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 the then that's correct, yes. There's still a missing step that I was referring to. I mean, your, your strategy is correct. Yeah. You have to convert them both to the infinity yes. depth. And that was the oh, yeah. Okay. So here's here's his suggestion. He said, well, I mean, if, if you know how this guy, how fast this guy is, is, uh, is, is uh, how, how fast this guy himself is, is, is seeing himself with through space time. That's this expression. We can use time dilation in principle to calculate how this guy and this guy's time are, are different from each other and just, you know, convert their uh, velocities in terms of each other. Now, the difficulty for a moment is that we don't know the time relation between this guy and this guy. What we know, that's exercise eight, that's this one here, how this guy and that guy have their time dilation. Here's the strategy. Take this guy's time, use this time dilation to calculate this guy's time, and then use this guy's and this guy's time dilation to get it back to this guy. I have no means of calculating this one directly in terms of this one. So I'm going to use the infinity guy as an intermediate step. That was your missing step. Yeah. 
But that means on the board we're missing one equation. What we have is the time dilation between him and him. In order to do the final step, we also need the time dilation between him and him. The non moving guy, right? The non moving guy. What I've said before, it's just two M. Yes. Now, we, you might want to get this from the line element just as an exercise of practice. Maybe we should do it right now. So we're missing one time dilation step. In fact, to get the notation all correct, if you want, if you're going to watch this recording at home, this time dilation is between, uh, this, sorry, this time dilation is between the, uh, the infinity guy and the orbital guy. That's this one. What we're missing still is the time dilation between the infinity guy and this guy. So it's tau r. That's one that we're missing. How to calculate it. Sorry, Kitty, I have a presentation too. Absolutely, but you will get the recording, yes? Hmm? You will yeah. get the recording of the final uh, steps of the exercise. Yeah. Going from the line element, you can relate d tau yes. and um, dt. Yes. Yes. And you know that phi doesn't change, r doesn't change. Data so doesn't change, okay. Now, this step that we're going to do now, so very quickly, should be no problem for you at this point. Okay? Time dilations between different observers should be an easy exercise now. So very quickly, we need this time dilation to your final step. Now to do this, you take your line element and really get it a little bit of the markers. So I happen to have my birthday in the, uh, in the summer. I'm going to ask for everybody, all family and friends, a big, oh, oh, big bowl of markers. Let's take time dilation, excuse me, the line element. The structure line element tells you that this is this. d yeah. tau squared minus 1, dr squared minus r squared, d uh, pi theta, sorry, squared minus r squared sine squared d squared. This is the line element. Yeah. What we are looking for is the time dilation between uh, this guy and that guy. And this guy's time, we had proved on Tuesday, is just a dt. Mm -hmm. So feel free to put your dt here, the infinity, that's that one. This guy, that will be his time. So let's put the r here. And now we have to put in all the information about this guy. Now he's not moving. At all. <coughs> so that means he's not moving in an orbit. The theta is zero. The phi is zero. The exercise says he's blasting himself with a rocket ship such that he has a fixed R as well. This one is zero. Gives you an extremely easy time. This is only, uh, I think George, you mentioned this, this is fully uh, 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 curvature related, there's no velocities. I thought there was you mentioned it. Some, yeah, sure. sure. It, 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 okay. <laughs> so wear these feathers, okay? So George, mm -hmm. in all his wisdom, says that this observer uh, has the luxury that he doesn't, that he only feels curvature time dilation. This guy feels curvature and velocity, and this guy feels neither. So. And now we're done. Take this expression, we've calculated it, convert it to this guy's time, you do this via this one. Then take that guy's time, convert it to this guy's time. For this you use this one. And well, adapt this expression as, as appropriate. I will give you the final answer so you can do this for yourself. You will find. This guy flies by this guy as seen by him. 
linear velocity, you might have to check this calculation because you know you might have made a mistake, but I think it's correct. If you do all the math, you do the two. It's this velocity. That's what I find. What is between m and r? The line divided by. Uh, uh, divided by. Yeah, this one. Or yeah, the the vertical line. Right, it's it's it's, a, ah. it's a divided by. Now you also see why the bookkeeper the uh, observer is so important, right? It allows you to calculate time relation between any two people. You just convert both of them to the bookkeeper guy, and then you correlate them to each other. Now, the exercise then asks as a final point, what happens if the r happens to be 6n? What happens to that velocity? Now, it's a matter of putting uh, r 6n in. Now, I told you already, 6n is the ISCO. The closest you can have a stable circular orbit, if you would put 6n in ISCO, you get 1 over the square root of 3, which is about 58% of the speed of light, 0.58. So apparently, if you let some spaceship get in, it's the closest it can get to the black hole in a circle orbit without falling in, and then you go watch how fast it goes, it goes through its motion with 58% of the speed of light. That's what you think. Is going like a stand for something each letter? Yes, in, in the innermost stable circular orbit. Uh -huh. Yes. I'm surprised. I think it's a three, by the way. I think I've made a mistake in writing this down. Is it? No, no, no. This is correct. This is correct. Okay, and so light can go at 2 m because light is always at the speed of light, whereas yeah. matter seems to slow down from the outside. You could do something fun here, and that is that uh, you can ask yourself, okay, how close must you orbit a black hole in order to see a thing go by with the speed of light? Mm -hmm. So you can ask, okay, if you want this to be exactly 1, the speed of light, how close must a thing have been to the black hole? So put this to 1, solve for how you get 3 m. And I mentioned earlier today that there is this orbit where massless particles go in a circular orbit. Mm. So it, it follows from this expression as well. If you want to see something fly by the speed of light, you have to put the thing at 3M. That's what this expression tells you. And that thing also has a name that's called the photosphere. The closest light can get in a circular orbit without before falling in. And obviously it's a little bit closer than, uh, than masses can. Mm -hmm. so. But light also can't go in circular orbit farther away, right? So it's really only at 3M. Uh, that is correct, yes, uh, because this is all geodesic, yes, so uh, that has only a unique solution, so if you find that, that a, uh, if, you, if photons have to go to the speed of light, and they do, then there's only one orbit that they can have a circular orbit. Mm -hmm. in, in other orbits, they're still allowed to move, it's just not circular, so you're right, so the photosphere is the unique orbit where light orbit. Get the orbits in a circle, that's a 3M. What about the neutrinos? Um, well, they have the same. Yeah, yeah. well, if, if 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 they're completely massless, then they're indistinguishable from mm. photons as far as relativity well, is concerned. But can light go in an elliptical orbit? It can't really, can it? Because it has to be at the same speed, so it's not like it can no, slow it down and spread right away. No, speed has has has, has three, three directions. So even if it slows down a little bit in its linear velocity, then its radial velocity will compensate. But that's a no, if, if you have a, 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 an elliptical orbit, say for a photon, um, you say, oh, but then it goes a little bit faster as it goes closer, and that, that should be impossible. But mind you, that uh, its radial uh, input is a little bit less. The velocity, generally, the velocities, the total amount of velocity, the combination of uh, how much it is moving in this way and in that way. Yeah. And so here, this one, which we now call the, uh, the orbital velocity, is allowed to be whatever as long as this one compensates such that this is still a speed of light. And what is the other one that is not the orbital velocity? Radial, radial, how fast is this one? 
moving regularly towards the black web. And their, their combination okay, is... Yeah. But on the... When it's like away from the black hole, why would the radio velocity be higher? Because, like, if you imagine, like, the typical, like, elliptical orbit around something, yes. then on the farther away side, if it still no, goes no, no, at no, the no. same. No, no, no. Look, if you have an ellipse like this, then close by, this, the these orbits are very much alike. So there's almost no change in the radio velocity. Right? Or there's almost no change in this radio distance. So radio velocity is almost zero. Whereas over here, from here to here, has a huge or a much bigger change in radio distance. So that means that from here to here, there's a high radio velocity. So far away, you expect a high radio velocity. So you have less orbital velocity. It's not very small. But the inward turning velocity is a lot bigger. And they compensate each other such that you get one again. OK. This is me reasoning out loud. I still don't, like, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I assume it's... Uh, well, well, to me it does, but I have never done the calculation, but it's interesting. Can light go into elliptical orbits? I see no immediate reason why not. And you don't know, that's, that's the question. Can it go into a sort of common light orbit? If you look at the point, at uh, this point, and at this point, <laughs> Exact same movement. Yes, but this uh, yes, but it moves faster here than it does on the other. But it's light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there's only one component of the velocity. That's my point. Uh, the light has, has multiple. Yeah, but I mean here it's going orthogonally to the radial velocity, so the radial velocity should be zero. That so it has to go equally fast. Both I at the close and far away point. I actually agree with that. Um, I think I agree with that. I think you might be right. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't know, but... No, no, no. I mean, you, you make a good point. Over here, the radial velocity, uh, by definition of this farthest point, is zero. Here is zero. So uh, that, uh, that means that all velocities only can come from the tangen tangential velocity. And this must be seen. This must be seen. You could probably yeah. argue that because of the low energy. Mm -hmm. You could maybe argue that because it's closer, time is dilated, so uh, because time slows down, the lift less frequency, so the light has less energy, energy mass mass conversion, the light is lighter, hence the gravitational pull isn't... Well, when well, mass doesn't, doesn't matter, matter no, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Because there's the uh, yeah, yeah. principle, the mass should not matter. Uh, so then it's no, no. uh, a super question to think about on a rating afternoon on Sunday. <laughs> Well, we have all the ingredients here, yes, and we should be able to solve this, so... Um, for now, I sort of think that the answer is yes, but on your argument to say the answer is no, so the answer is I don't know. <laughs> but we have all the ingredients, we can do this calculation. Okay, guys, thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you for practice. Thank you. You can, could you upload, or could you do the other video on the questions that you gave us? Oh, that's fine. That is fine. Now, <laughs> let's do the radio info thing. Um, the exercise guides you through it because the mathematics is, uh, again, involved. But, um, there we go. So it required some uh, extra thinking and I decided, you know what, I'm going to just give you the steps. We are going to look at the following situation. What we have here is a black hole, a certain mass m, and we're going to have another mass who's going to fall radially in, geodesically. So an unpowered spaceship or whatever you want to call it is going to fall in. And the idea is, let's see if we can find the expression for this guy's motion, just as we did for the circular orbit. Now, it, again, it turns out that the mathematics is, is unfortunately, somewhat cumbersome. But with a series of steps that I put on the exercise sheet, we uh, are quite quickly able to find out what the expression is. But first, a strategy we need. 
It's a geodesic motion. It's an unpowered mass falling in. Hmm. Evaluating the variables, like what happens there. Which variables? Yeah, t r m t time frame. Since it's like a radial, just like straight line, so you only consider t and r. Right? Yes, that is correct. So let's let's immediately start there, because the premise of the question is it's a radial infall. So that means by definition, the tau, the theta d tau is zero, and the uh, phi d tau is zero, and the only ones that we're looking for are the r d tau and the t d tau. Now the d d tau, you understand what uh, the meaning is, yes? You will get a d t d tau which is certainly not zero. So uh, what, what does it? It's a curvature. The time dilation due to the curvature. Uh, yes, but between who and who? Uh, between the infinitely far observer and this one? yes and M. Yes. So this guy measures a certain amount of time. Yeah. This guy measures a certain amount of time. Now, who, who is who in in our expressions there? Who is dt? Who is d tau? M is d tau, yes. and the infinite guy this is guy d tau. This guy measures d tau. That guy measures dt. Is there any other observer for which d t and d tau are, you know, he's the bookkeeper, but not necessarily infinitely away and stationary? Yes, or that is, is the condition that he's infinitely away and stationary. Uh, in, in order for the d t that you find in the Schwarzschild line element uh, to be an observer, that observer has to be infinitely far away and stationary. Okay. Now, you could have an exercise where you're going to compare two observers who, who are none of the two are happen to be that infinitely far away guy. Then you have to think a little bit how you're going to relate these other two people to each other. I'll be very quick, by the way. Again, the, the other recording does this in more detail. But suppose that you have a guy here, and you have another guy there, and you're going to compare their mutual time dilation, say. Now, neither of these two is the bookkeeper guy at infinity, so neither of them will measure dt. So how would you calculate their time dilation? Suppose that this guy measures d tau a, this is person a, this person b, d tau b. How would you find something like this? Their mutual time dilation. Do you have to introduce a guy and then relate them to? Didn't we do this on Tuesday in the tutorial? I don't think we did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something very, uh, yeah do we have to introduce? a third party with which they can yes. compare to. Let's do that. Let's find out how this guy and that guy's time are related. So find out dt, d yeah. tau a. Let's then find out how this guy and that guy are related, d t, d tau b. And once you have these two, yeah. then you can relate a and b to each other. Yeah. So th this is how you can use the bookkeeping device, the, the bookkeeper uh, observer, even if you're not interested in his numbers, you can use him as a sort of a intermediate, step. A, a, yes, intermediate step between the two, yeah. yes. So that, you really see that the bookkeeper, the name bookkeeper is really well chosen because it really keeps track of, of multiple people at the same time and just related to each other. Now, not so here. Here it's really just one guy and indeed the bookkeeper guy. All right, so we're going to have our time dilation. Fine. We're also going to have our d r d tau. Probably not going to be zero well, because the guy is falling in, so it's probably some velocity that he will have. How to find these? Just you just ask a question, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> just have to write down the Euler's equations, and uh, in the Euler's equations, now we're going to set to zero everything that contains these. Now this is a step I uh, am going to just write down. No trouble there for nobody, I think, right? You know what the geodesic equations look like, you know what to put to zero. You will get that uh, the, 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 the d theta and d phi differential equations both give you zero equals zero. Sounds like tautology, it isn't. If you have, would have found four equals zero, it just means things are not allowed to fall radially into a black hole, and that this motion was not allowed. Nature allows it. Unfortunately, you are free to fall into black holes. And the equations that remain are these two. Just to 
of writing of these Yeltsin equations in their abbreviated form takes time. Okay, so here's one of them. As you can see, no uh, d theta, d tau, d phi, d tau. Here's the other one. And neither of these depend on small m. Uh, no, that's, that, that is the equivalence principle. It doesn't oh, matter yeah. what falls in. All masses would fall the same, so there's no need to put any in. So the answer is, is yes or, or no. They, they, neither of them depend on small m. If they did, one mass would follow differently than another mass, which is against the equivalence principle. Or at least it's weak form. Man, what a crappy expression. You know what's even more crappy about these compared to the other ones? There. And the, the other two are 0 equals 0. What is crappy about this one compared to the other ones is, in the other ones, at least the R's were constants because of orbital motion. Not so much here. So now you have to solve a set of two differential equations where even the numbers in front of the derivatives are not constant. No. They depend on t themselves. That's why they guide you towards the killing method. Yes. This is exactly what the book says in chapter 8. You know what? Here's some killing method mm -hmm. <laughs> to do this with. And me being the evil person that I am decided, nope, we're going to do the geodesic way. <laughs> but I was friendly enough to put some uh, intermediate steps. Now, there's really no hope of trying to put this into Mathematica and then hope that he will find the, the, the answer for you, yes. And unless you're extremely good at guessing, I have a hard time believing that you would guess the solution to this one. So, hence the intermediate steps that I write on the exercise sheet. Here's intermediate step number one. Don't ask me where I got the steps from. Just give, see them as a God-given gift. Me not being God, but me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's something to be, to be happy about, okay? Mm -hmm. So, the exercise says, we'll first prove the following. I'm going to guess the answer is 42. The answer is what? 42. <laughs> oh, uh, the light universe and everything? Mm -hmm. Thomas Adams? First prove that the following is true, the exercise says. by Killing method, this is an expression we had before. If you just square root both sides and you call this small e, this is what we already had proven by the Killing method. Mm -hmm. So we can also take this now as given. Although then we assume that the Killing's method is true. Is true. Uh, there's another way of showing that this is true. Yes, the Killing method is fine, by the way. Right? We just exploit the fact that the Schwarzschild space-time um, has a symmetry in its t direction. That gives you this equation by Killing's method. But for the people who say, well, suppose I didn't know the Killing method, you can also do it as follows. What you can do is um, you can take this guy's derivative on both sides with respect to tau. So dd tau both sides of this equation. of left hand side and of right hand side. Now the right hand side will give you zero of course. Work out this expression. I'm going to skip that step, it's just crappy uh, derivative taken. But maybe you can already see that at the very least you will get a second derivative with respect to d tau, dt d tau. And you have some other stuff here because you have to take this guy's derivative with respect to r, or with, with respect to tau. In fact, you can already sort of guess what will happen. Look, this dd tau on this part will give you a dt dr, uh, dr d tau somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Or if it's dependent on the tau, yeah. Yes, of course, yes, because it's now a non uh, uh, constant. constant. So take the dd tau of this whole thing that the product rule tells you, you have to take at the very least this guy's uh, derivative, which will give you ultimately a d, dr d tau, and then multiply with this. Then the product rule also says, well, then you also have to take this as constant and take this guy's derivative. That will give you a uh, dt d tau times the second derivative of t with respect to tau. It's 
to do the product rule here. Mm -hmm. Note then that the two terms that you get from a product rule will, will both have an overall dt detail uh, across that one out, left and right. So you end up with something that says second derivative of r with respect to tau equals something that has a dr detail and another dt detail. That's this equation. Yeah. So if you take this guy's derivative with respect to tau and you work out the mathematics, you will find, oh, but wait a minute, that's exactly this. And the first geodesic equation tells you that it's zero. Okay. So here's a, an explicit way for this particular case to show that, uh, that Killing's theorem gives you the right answer. Is the strategy clear to everybody how to do this? Now, don't ask me how you would have guessed this in the first place. Could have been Killing's method. But given that this is the case, you can easily check. Take its derivative and check then that this equation tells you that, it is indeed, that this thing is indeed constant. Good. So, that means this step is now solved. I don't think we should spend time doing the actual derivatives. Uh, I assume you're perfectly capable of doing the derivatives and check it for yourself. Now, um, then there's another claim. That's the second step that the exercise gives you. It says using this, this result that we have now found, show that the following is true: that dt dr is minus r over two m. Using this, show that this is true. No, this is completely tau independent. It's just t in terms of, 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 of uh, r in terms of t, of t in terms of r, no taus anymore. What did you use to get that? Uh, that, that, well, that? That is the question. How do we get this? Oh, that's the step you're skipping. No, I'm going to tell you now. Okay. Um, but I'm just taking the exercise by the letter. The, the exercise says, now that you know that this is true, show that this is true. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, before we do so, suppose that we have proven that this is indeed true. You have a differential equation. Mm -hmm. You can take, if you want, you can take the dr to the r side here, integrate both sides. Then this will just give you t. Right, if you integrate this and integrate that, this will give you t. Well, this will give you something crappy because you have to integrate over r. The r comes in all kinds of unnatural places, unholy places there. But you can find some expression here that will give you something with an r. But then we have the motion of the of the thing moving inward. Now usually what you have, what you want, is, is R, T. R as a function of t. And if somebody tells you the time, you can tell where, where he is. But mathematics is too difficult. This happens to be somewhat easier. That you get, if you tell me where the particle is, I can tell you what time it is. <laughs> but it's the same information, right? It's just um, in the opposite order, if you want. Yeah. But the information is in there. Couldn't you also invert t of r to get r of t? Oh yeah, I mean, if you're lucky enough that this expression can I'm easily be inverted, inverted. Oh, okay. let me, uh, here it is, this is the answer. <laughs> it's some crappy combination no, of logarithms and square roots of r, and inverting that is hard. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. But at the very least, ultimately you will end, you end up with how the time and the r are related. By the way, whose time is that? If I tell you that um, the thing that this particle is in location so and so. This thing spits out what time it is. Whose time is that? The observers and the infinite far away. Yes, it will be this guy's time. Mm -hmm. So what you will end up with is some relation between what he measures on the clock and where this guy is. Which is enough, I guess, to find how the thing moves, right? It, yeah. it will tell you how the falling inward looks as seen by him. All of this hinges on this mathematical step here. That you can prove this relation from this relation. 
from that moment onwards, we can follow this strategy. How? Is your question now? Yes. suggestion because this expression tells you dt d tau and this does not contain a d tau so apparently you have to change your rule yourself out of some d taus here. Mm. Yeah the thing is oof it's complicated. <laughs> is it though really? Yeah it is but we can maybe take the two geodesic equations the first top two and did well Take all the turns to the right hand side except for the first two turns of both equations and okay. then divide those by each other is gonna give you something and then the lines of D2. Yeah, turns. it looks it looks quite good, right? I mean if you the the divide these by each other yeah. you, you do get something like this. Yeah. So that sounds good. Um, so let's use one of these equations to replace the, the D tau by D T. Then th that would work. Now I would not recommend doing it here. First of all, these are second derivatives, and the yeah. second derivatives is a lot harder than dividing the first derivatives. But secondly, this exp expression was given, and we saw that it's equivalent to the first to, to this one. So maybe it's easier to, to just take this one. But the suggestion is, is, is fully correct. So you could say, for instance, uh, uh, bom, bom, bom. The dt. So we have to prove that this is true. Let me start with the left hand side. I'm really just taking your suggestion now. Let's chain rule this into something that looks more familiar. Left hand side, if I'm not mistaken, would be dt d tau d tau dr. This is chain rule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be dt d tau dr d tau minus 1. And uh, look, so it looks as if we can use this equation that we've proven and use it to replace this. Hmm. By the way, the constant should be given a value. Uh, I think you should put it in one. Yes, the exercise says put this to one. It could be any value. In the proof of this equation, the value was not specified, so you can take any value, the exercise says take the value 1. Now, if we do that, we're going to talk a little bit why the value 1, but if we would do that, then I think this thing can be replaced by 1 minus 2m over r, square root, dr d tau minus 1. I think that's correct. So I've now used that. Well, that sort of already looks like the, the thing we have to prove, right? No. <laughs> Getting closer now. Now, we did have to take this to be 1 and not 4 or minus 17. That would be a nice exercise on an exam. Why do we take the number 1? What does that mean physically? Feel free to uh, do some inter interpreting of that equation now. Maybe it has to with units. That's why we take this one. Uh, Uh, no, the unit doesn't specify numbers, it just specifies uh, how many G's and C's are in there, but not whether it's 15 times G and C or, or minus 4 times G and C. So I, I suggest the exercise take give it the value 1. Why did I give it the value 1? Mm. What does the TT tell me, by the way? Between this guy and that guy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's one over the square root of one minus two m over r. Okay. If you make the constant one. But this number cannot change, right? Yes. So that should be that the whole killing thing, or mm -hmm. we've proved it from this. Yes. That number should not. If it, if it is one, it's it's always been one, and it will yes. always stay one. Is that, so isn't that the energy per unit mass thing? I I agree. 
we saw that when we yeah. discussed the killing uh, vectors. And if it, if this number has to be one at any point where the particle is, it's, it's it, the, the value is one here, it is one here, it is one here, it is one there. Whatever the particle is it, in, in its trajectory, because of its constancy of that number, it should be one throughout, yes? Mm -hmm. How about when the particle was at the stationary infinity, uh, observer at infinity? Was this one? Why not? What, 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 the, what would the value be? Ah, it's just one over one, so it's just d of the observer at infinity. Yes. Mm -hmm. If this is one throughout the whole trajectory, so it's also one at the moment that r is infinity, yeah. when the thing was at what was 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 just leaving the bookkeeper guy. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's no time dilation. Then there's no time dilation. Okay, interpret that. At the moment that this particle was leaving the guy here, there was no time dilation. This guy's time and that guy's time was at that moment exactly the same. The t d tau was one. What does yeah. that mean physically? They're at the same location. That is certainly true, because they are. Yeah. Are at infinity. Yeah. But time dilation is a little bit more than just location. Yeah. Does that mean that you had like your initial velocity? Yes. What was the relation? Because there's time dilation consists of there is uh, no special velocities. There no was relative no velocity. velocity. There was no time dilation in its totality. Yeah. Now, if they are at the same location, of course, there's no gravitational time dilation, but the oneness says there was also no special time dilation. So it dilation. started from rest. At it infinity. started from rest. Here was this guy who just dropped a little mass and let it coast toward the black hole. Uh, That's what it meant. The oneness here means you just let it start from rest. If I would have put the number 17, I would have meant I, I gave, a little, a little, gave a little kick towards the black hole. <laughs> okay? Mm. So, okay. Now we're almost there, because we have seen now that we understand that this is true, that's exactly what, what we have to prove, but then we have to prove that this equals that. If we can prove that that is the case, then we have proven the statement. Can you just draw it from analogy? Do you have to prove it? What do you mean by analogy? I mean, Simply saying, you take the chain rule, that's all mathematically correct, and then you separated the variables, kind of, yeah? Yeah. And you can just... All right, we still have to prove that, that's right. Can I just take it as a given? Well, we have certainly proven it at the moment that we have proven that dr v tau minus 1 equals uh, minus r over 2m. If, if, if we can prove this, then we've proven that this is that, and then we've proven the whole thing. The only thing you have to, we have to prove is this, and then the statement is correct. The only thing I see that we can use is the second juridistic equation, but that seems really complicated. But it seems also really correct, mm -hmm. because we have already used this geodesic equation to prove this statement. Mm -hmm. This one we have not used at all yet. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for what r is as a function of tau. Well, that's exactly what this equation tells you. Yeah. So the only thing we have to do, we don't have to solve this equation from scratch. Okay. We have been given a solution. Just check whether this whether this is correct. Put this one into this this equation. If it gives you zero equals zero, then this is correct, and we're done. Hmm. Okay. The next. Yeah. We haven't used the second this equation yet. So we use that. Now, that step, of course, skip it a skip. Just exercise in doing derivatives. Just put it in, do the algebra, see that it fits. And now we are where the exercise wants us. The dt dr is given by this expression. And now we can do this integral. <laughs> Nobody wants to solve this integral. Okay? Take the dr to the other side, integrate this. <coughs> So I did it with Mathematica. I said, please Mathematica, give me a solution to this one because I'm too lazy to try it myself. I'm going to give you the answer. Once we've interpreted that, I think that we have done enough for today. But it is a fun exercise. Uh, I have a midterm on quantum. Then, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, then you should go. Uh, how much overtime are we?
15 minutes after. Oh, really? Are That's fine. Are yeah. you sure? Yeah. It's okay if you yeah, finish it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, as well? Yeah, absolutely. No, no, no. This is your time. It's, no, I should apologize for taking yours. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah, good luck, Mike. It was just like... Our presentation. That's what we're talking about. Good time. Might as well stay here then. Don't you also have? But I would like to stay. Yeah, it's fine. You can see it on the video later. Oh, you you did quantum with me, right? No, I'm doing now. Okay. Do you not also have a presentation? What? I'm doing quantum theory. Yes, I do. No. No, that's quantum chemistry. Oh my god, okay. Oh my god. Yeah, this is something you would not have guessed, I guess. <laughs> How much did it take you for I guess to do that? that? No, I just typed it in mathematics. Ah, no, no, sorry, no. sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. My mistake. Uh, I'm sure if, 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 if you have nothing to do for two hours, then I'm sure you can, f you know, by some educated guessing and revising and revising fine case, but I just took it from mathematics at this point. This is crazy. Yeah, it's ridiculous. But so, And this is the easy way, right? That we, that we had some intermediate steps. People actually did this from scratch. Yeah, so somebody at some point found this solution without using all these tricks. I bet they didn't estimate 42. <laughs> so this is the solution. And despite this complicated expression, this is apparently how nature, the black hole, gravity, will make this mass fall inwards if you would drop it from rest. So specific. Like, why two thirds? It's <laughs> 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 no, a good question. And why the log? Why well, the you log? have the logarithm, which is not that two thirds, you know? Hmm? The logarithm, it goes not like, it goes continuously. So you will have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So but just yeah. something to, 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 to kind of um, say here. The R here is the one measured by the person falling? Uh, no, uh, we, we proved in the tutorial of Tuesday that the bookkeeper guy is not just the guy who measures the T in the spreadsheet, but, but also the, the, uh, the who's, who also measures the R's. Yeah. So if you would ask this guy uh, what distance he has traveled, he could come up with a different answer than this guy. So everything here is the motion of how this guy is falling, written in this guy's Radial and this guy's temporal coordinates. Perfect, but then that R in itself is also dependent on T. Yeah, but, it, but, yeah, but this is a relation. But you it's not that like, much of a problem because you're looking at the position. So it's like, for example, you're going to look at 2M. When they are 2M, they're both going to look at the same place. Yes. No, that's true. Uh, that, that is Maybe the value for itself is going to be, yeah, it's going to be for sure different. But do you have any difficulty interpreting, uh, aside from the complicated, you know, the fact there's a logarithm and these strange powers and everything, the, the interpretation of the thing is quite clear, yes? This thing is falling inward, starting from rest, we saw this from this, the fact that this was one. So what this expression tells you is that if this guy is at a certain location r from the black hole, mm -hmm. then it was t seconds ago since it left this guy. If you want to know the complete time it took from reaching the yeah. infinity up until entering the black hole or yes. getting at a distance of 2m, then you have to integrate that thing along the path. No, 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 no. Wouldn't it be infinite time because it's from infinity? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, but uh, you don't have to integrate anymore. This already gives you the amount of time. Uh -huh. This tells you how, what it's time it is. Down. As you, as you get closer to the 2M, it slows down, like closer to zero. Ah, oh, I see. I'm yeah, sure. no, no, yeah, that, let's, let's do that step now. Mm -hmm. So, the question was, how long does it take Just sub in for this M. guy to see that guy fall into the black hole? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, you just have to put in R is 2M. What time is it at the moment that this guy is at the 2M, the size of the black hole? Now, without going into all the details, uh, this is where you will find your answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. R over 2m, where r is now 2m itself, gives you zero. The logarithm of 1 over 0 is the logarithm of, of infinity. And the logarithm of infinity is itself infinity. Um, so, so it takes infinite time. It continues falling, but just 
Yes. Uh, and so see, but this guy see. slows down, slows down, slows down. So he falls in, but the way that this guy sees it, this mass is slowing down on its way towards the black hole and never actually reaches it. Which makes sense, because at 2M we said for an observer infinitely away, you just see something that's being still. Yes, and that's and what you see here as well. So that's saying that something is taking forever to get to something, the same as saying, well, it's not doing anything. Yes. Not at the beginning, though. The first yes. you know, bunch of time, you, you see the thing fall in, but it slows down, as seen from infinity, as it falls in, all the way to the point where it slows down infinitely much. So you, if I drop something and kick it towards the black hole, I didn't kick, I just let it go this way from, from rest, I would have to wait an infinite amount of time before the thing actually has fallen in. It's kind of sad. You never. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's pretty cool. I remember when I was a kid. By the way, this is the end of the exercise. But remember, I remember when I was a kid that I read this science fiction little novel. It was very short. Uh, on uh, a couple of people who were in a spaceship, uh, astronauts, and unfortunately they were being sucked into a black hole and the spaceship was out of fuel or whatever it was. And uh, they only had one escape pod. And then the, the four or five astronauts, or how many were in there, just had to decide who would take the escape pod and escape. The other ones knew we were going to fall in and be sucked into and spaghettified and everything. And they, they drew straws. And there was this one astronaut who was the lucky quote-unquote guy who got to take the escape pod. He blasted away, and the story ended. But I didn't understand it when I was a, when I was a, a small kid. But the story ended by saying that he was happy that he survived. But every time they looked at the sky, he could see, still see his his crewmates fall to their deaths. Oh. They never looked at the sky anymore, literally, because he could still see these people falling in. That's yeah. dark. Yeah, it's really good. But well, it's, but that shouldn't be a kid's book. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't. They shouldn't have read that. But, but what we see here, that is physically true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my god, wow, yeah. Every time <laughs> he looks up, he sees them slowly die. Oh my god. Yeah, but here's the good news that that wasn't part of the story. But when I studied general relativity later, I realized that, yeah, wait a minute, but that light that he sees is redshifted. So he sees them die, but he sees them die much more. The, as time goes on, the redshift of the, the visuals that he sees is also bigger and bigger. And at some point, it goes beyond his optical spectrum. So you don't see it anymore. You don't oh, see okay. it anymore, right? You can finally have peace. Uh, but peace. also, <laughs> for them, they're also getting elongated yeah. infinitely at those distances. So what is exactly is he seeing? Is he seeing them? He, he sees them being elongated, increasingly slowly, and increasingly more red. And okay. that takes until so until they disappear. Yes. And and uh, <coughs> and he had the biological that was a part of the story, this, this, but it is true. He has the biological advantages, the guy looking through space, that you can only see so far into the red with mm -hmm. your human eye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so at some point the stretching of the 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 the, 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 the the sad fate of his crewmates, the red shifting was so big that it would be outside of his biological spectrum. So at some point he would stop seeing these people die. That was a kid's book. <laughs> it, no, it, was, uh, it wasn't. And, uh, I, I assume you're not going to let any kids read it. <laughs> no, but uh, honestly, like to understand it, prerequisite, no general relativity. <laughs> <laughs> that is a sad story, right? But again, it's true. It's, this is what physics does. Gideon, yeah. um, what would happen if we had uh, tau r? We would see what happens from the observer yes. moving. Well, we actually have that because look, if we have the amount of time that it takes, uh, we have somewhere on the board, yeah, here it is, we can convert it to what these people themselves see. Mm -hmm. right? You think it would be easy to no, I think drive it's, it? Yeah, it, it, you do the same uh, process, just that you use the It's just a differential. Yeah, yeah, but it's bad, yeah, be, be careful here because you, what you have to put in, you have to put in this T, put it in here and then mm. integrate for tau. But because you've replaced t by this expression, this has now become an r-dependent function which itself depends on tau. So, so it's the t dr, dr d tau, and in that dr d tau you have what you want. Yes, and then you have to integrate that thing. Yeah, okay. Then. Now, what yeah. I will tell you is that that amount of time, as seen by these people themselves, is finite. So they themselves see themselves sucked in, in, I don't know, whatever it is, uh, two weeks, three weeks, five seconds. So th they just fall in and at some point they've fallen in. 
pass it to endpoint. It's just from infinitely far away. That takes forever. Mm. So strategy-wise, yes. <laughs> Take this, put it in here, but it makes it a DRD, uh, uh, excuse me, not here. Take this, uh, put it in here. That makes it ultimately a DRD tau mm. uh, equation. Solve, then, for it. solve for detail, but that means an integration over R, and the R unfortunately is very complicated because of this. But it, it, it can be done. Feel free to do it in Mathematica or so. Uh, the answer is going to be finite, even if uh, at R is 2M. Okay. okay, well, thank you guys. It took longer than. Uh, than uh, it's okay. Thank you. Well, Rodrigo, that's an exercise for you on a rainy Sunday. Okay, have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. Thank, Thank you too. for your uh, ample contributions. I really enjoy doing this exercise with you in this way. I feel that it's a two-way street. So, uh, so great. And the rest of the afternoon is more general relativity for me and nice salons. And Tuesday is uh, gravitational. Yes, Tuesday we're going to talk about.